This is the second half of the Intro to Typography lecture for the beginning graphic design class. And in this lecture, we will continue to explore the history of typography and how it affects written communication today. So where we left off, the Industrial Revolution and Machine Age drove an immense amount of innovation as well as commerce. For the first time, goods were mass produced, resulting in the need to sell products. This created the need for advertising and branding. This also led to the creation of new typefaces, for the first time, typefaces were existing in environments that were not just about reading. It was no longer Bibles and manuscripts and books. Suddenly there were posters and playbills and flyers and elements of packaging that needed to connect with the audience, that needed to potentially yell across a room. And we saw typography like this. We saw for the first time slab serif typefaces. We saw the wide use of sans serif typefaces. We see a lot of display oriented typefaces appear. Things like shaded and Tuscan typefaces. We see a lot of settings like this in the Victorian era where there's lots of mixing of type to really try to grab someone's attention. This really starts with Vincent Figgins. He lived and worked in England, and during the time he was alive, Hiroshige would have been painting some of his work in Japan. And Figgins is really credited as creating and inventing the slab serif style of typeface. And that's what we're seeing on the right with Mankind or the sample from Figgins on the left. And that's where the serifs are really enlarged, they're made these rectangular slabs that really call attention to them. They become these design elements within the typeface, and their goal is really to attract attention and to create an even bolder letter form. In some ways, this was an evolution of the fat face, which is what you're seeing at the top with furniture, where they took the modern and really increased that contrast and created this boldness in the fix that made it very eye-catching. This was really pioneered by Robert Thorne. This is David Burlow's Giza that was done for Font Bureau. This is a typeface that really referenced and looked at Figgins and other people's work from the beginning of slab serif typography. Sometimes slab serifs are also called Egyptians or antiques. The word Egyptian really comes from the fact that during this time period, Egypt was very in vogue. It was very popular culturally. So they decided to attribute this word to this style of typeface to try to jump on that bandwagon and create some interest behind slab serif typefaces. Here's an example of some fat based typography. So you can see very clearly those large, large thicks contrasted with those thin, thin. So this evolution of a modern where it's taken to this really playful way. It's no longer about it being readable. It's really for more eye-catching, loud typography. During this era, we also see for the first time condensed and extended typefaces. This is a specimen from Durberny and Pignot from Paris, and it's an example of a condensed modern but we can really see those condensed letter forms, how they're elongated. And this really came out of a necessity that if letter forms were condensed, words could be larger on a page, which would make them easier to be seen. So again, a lot of these developments, a lot of these advancements are really being driven from advertising. They're really being driven from this new demand to suddenly let people know about products and things and events. Here's a diagram from Rob Roy Kelly. He's a wood type historian that lives in Texas. And it's a great diagram that shows some of the different serifs that came up in the slab serif era. So if we look at the top, going from left to right, we see on the very left that antique or that traditional slab serif with that 90 degree angle, that enlarged brick-like slab. And then one to the right, we see that there's a cutting happening. So on that interior 90 degree angle, it's actually being cut and rounded. We actually refer to this as bracketing in typography. And when we bracket a slab serif, it becomes a clarendon. So it's another type of slab serif. And what's interesting is a lot of these slab serif typefaces were actually made in wood. And that made it very easy to modify these typefaces. So at times they might take the typeface on the left and then make that circular cut on the interior and turn it into a clarendon style typeface. And the same that third from the left, we can see there that they've cut that slab off at an angle to create this triangular serif. And we refer to that as a Latin, a Latin style slab serif. So they have these triangular pointy serifs. And then on the far right, we have the Tuscans, which is a genre of slab serif typography that are very ornamental. They have these very decorative serifs that are cut in multiple ways. If we look down at the very bottom, you can see that they even bifurcate which is where that serif splits apart and becomes two separate pieces. So that's often something we also see in Tuscans. But again, these are all of the different permutations and different modifications and different styles of slab serifs that appeared during this era. 
And that really drove this kind of work. Because there was all this experimentation, because there were all of these different kinds of typefaces, we actually had this mixing, or where they would blend all these different kinds of typefaces together so that it would become this catch-all. Because again, the idea here was that if we use all these different typefaces, there's all these different voices and there's a lot of things to grab the viewer. And it's not too far off from the work of the futurists where they worked like this with setting type at different sizes and mixing different typefaces, but more here to create type as image. They explored a lot of onomatopoeia. They worked a lot with poetry, setting type in interesting shapes and directions. They really wanted the type to feel like the content. And again, I cover this because I feel this is so important for what we do. This is really the beginning of us as graphic designers and our seeking of creating type as image and creating meaning that does justice to what the words are saying. And so this all influenced and created a lot of different kinds of typography and different styles of setting type that really evolved into the basis of our profession. Then we have William Morris. He lived in the United Kingdom and he lived there from 1834 and died in 1896. Van Gogh would have been painting during his lifetime. And he was one of the leaders of the arts and crafts movement. And he predominantly ran the Kelmscott Press, which was a very notable press. And he created this, which is golden type. And it was something he created specifically for Kelmscott Press. And his idea was he wanted to go back to the work of Jensen, but he wanted to actually retain the spreading and the darkness of the letter forms. Because if we look back at the specimen of Jensen, we're really looking here at ink on paper. And when the type hits the paper and creates that impression, there is a slight amount of spreading where we get this thickening and this blurriness of the letter form. And especially this long ago, the technology of printing and ink and paper were not as sophisticated as they are today. So that was even exaggerated based on the kinds of tools that existed. So a lot of people like Robert Slimbach that we see on the right, when they do a revival would go and look at the letter forms and maybe try to find their purest form to try to imagine what the punches would have looked like or the actual metal type itself. But here, William Morris has done something completely different. He's actually decided to keep the spreading and the darkness. He's chosen it as a narrative or a stylistic quality that he really wanted to keep in the typography. So even though printing is much more sophisticated and paper is much better quality at this point, he's purposefully retaining that darkness for a certain stylistic effect. So again, that's just an interesting contrast to what most revivals up to this point have been. Then we have Morris Fuller Benton. We're finally in the United States and he's one of the most notable American typographers. During his lifetime, Klimt would have been painting. He was extremely prolific and one of the most influential early American typographers. He worked for the American Type Foundry and created many typefaces that we still see today, like New Century Schoolbook, Morris Sands, Franklin Gothic, and ITC Souvenir. One of his most notable typefaces is Franklin Gothic, and it was released in 1904. He did many sans serif grotesque oriented typefaces, but this is one of his best. It was incredibly popular in the United States and is still used extensively today. It comes in a range of weights and styles and is featured often in editorial work. Frederick Gowdy was another influential American typographer. He also created typefaces for the American Type Foundry and invented typefaces such as Copper Plate, Cuts of Trajan, and many typefaces named after himself. Here's some of his work. One of his most notable releases is Gowdy Old Style. It was released by the American Type Foundry in 1915 and was one of their most successful releases ever. It's a typeface that you can still use today. Then we have Edward Johnston. He worked and lived in England. He was a notable calligrapher and one of the masters of his time. He often explored the boundaries of calligraphy and did extensive research on the rationalization of letter forms. He often looked at how letter forms should be constructed and did some research in sans serif typography and the construction models that should be used by calligraphy pens. But he's most famous for being hired by the London Transport Authority to create the typeface for London's underground transportation system, oftentimes referred to as the underground. This is his work that he did for the London Transport Authority. It resulted in this geometric monolinear typeface that was really ahead of its time. It had incredible precision 
and high quality that was a product of Johnson's amazing calligraphic background. Here's a revival of the typeface that tries to do it justice, but it's really known for its geometry, these round forms and square and triangular shapes. It has a rationality to it and a monolinear structure that makes it feel very perfect. There are many other typefaces like this, notably Gill Sands, which was designed by Eric Gill and was somebody that worked under Edward Johnson. Then we see work like this. This is modular typography done by De Steele at the top and the Bauhaus at the bottom. This was where the structure of the typography and the way it was made directed the look of the type. So the actual limitations that are being placed on these letter forms in terms of how the shapes can be used and what kinds of shapes can be used are actually ultimately determining the aesthetic quality of how these letters look. At the top where there's different rectangular shapes that are being strung together to spell de steel, it has a blocky and stencil look to it and that's really a result of the way that the letter forms are being constructed. Or the bottom, this piece by Theo von Dosberg, where they're only allowing horizontal and vertical lines to be used, which restricts the way that these letter forms have to be constructed and ultimately creates strong unity and this modular aesthetic. We saw this pushed even further here by Herbert Bayer. He was a student of the Bauhaus and in 1925 he was hired to create a typeface for the Bauhaus. It's called Universal Alphabet and you can see the influence of that modularity. These circular structures that are put into as many of the letter forms as possible. And so this use of modularity in all of these different kinds of ways really drove the evolution and the discovery of new styles of letter forms. Then we have a very important advancement when Paul Renner released Futura in 1927. This typeface was much desired at the time. Designers were really looking for something that embraced the modern movement with a minimal and functional aesthetic and Futura really hit the mark. It's a beautiful typeface, here's one of its specimens, and it appears to have perfect geometry and a completely perfect monolinear structure, but it's really a brilliant illusion that was created by Renner. There's a lot of adjustments happening here, including that the O's are actually elliptical, but that allows your eyes to perceive them as perfect circles. So it's a very beautiful typeface that was drawn with great precision and is still used extensively today. So as technology continues to change and influence culture and the way our society operates, it eventually has an effect on the typographic industry itself. So we've seen at this point industrialization and machinery incorporating itself into all different kinds of industries and advancing them and making them more efficient. But up to this point, we haven't seen that in typography. At this point, we are still seeing type either made in wood or in metal in the processes that I showed in the last lecture with matrices and punches and pouring into molds. We're also still seeing type set by hand in some kind of a lockup where each letter is put individually to create words. And so eventually that efficiency and that machinery hits the typographic industry. Because for magazines, newspapers, and periodicals in particular, there was really a need to advance and make a quicker way to create this content. So we see the creation of the monotype machine. And the monotype machine is two machines that work in conjunction. This is the casting unit that would actually cast hot metal type. So there are matrices and molds that exist within this machine. And it works in conjunction with the keyboard unit where the operator would actually enter the text that's necessary. So there's multiple keyboards here, those controlled uppercase, lowercase, small caps, things like that. And then this would actually produce a piece of perforated tape that would be put into the casting machine and it would actually cast those words into metal type. So ultimately you would get letters like this and they would come out in a line at a time, but they weren't connected, they're individual letters. So this made things much more efficient. For one, there was no longer a need to worry about having the right amount of letters or type. You could just create what you needed at any given time. It also set the type together so you were able to kind of group it and move it and use it all at once which really refrained from you having to find a letter and put it where it went. It was already being set correctly in the way that it was supposed to be read. So this is huge advantages and we saw this really take off. This really starts to dominate the typography industry and it appears around the late 1800. Its competitor is another machine called the Linotype. The Linotype was very much the same as the Monotype in that it cast hot metal type, but there was one considerable difference. One, you'll notice that it's one machine. The keyboard actually exists within the casting unit. But the second thing was that it actually made an entire line of type. So that's where the name of the machine comes from, linotype, line of type. So it actually had the ability to cast an entire line in one piece of metal. 
And this was really advantageous because now that typography setting has become so much more efficient with the creation of these hot metal setting machines, we no longer are worried about mistakes and wanting to be able to replace one letter. It's actually more efficient to replace an entire line if needed because we can create them so quickly. And there's an advantage here because there's fewer small pieces and it makes it much simpler to set these things together. So the Linotype machine definitely started to dominate the market and continued to push hot metal typesetting era. And this would become the way that typography was made predominantly for the next 80 to 100 years. Then we have Hermann Zapp. He was a German typographer and master calligrapher. He was really known for his technical expertise. And again, he was a very, very gifted and knowledgeable calligrapher. He's known for some typefaces that are still used today, like Palatino and Optima, as well as this typeface Melior that came out in 1952. It's built on a square circle construction method and it has this rounded outside but slightly square inside. It's classified as a transitional serif, although it is often said to be one of the more difficult typefaces to classify. Then we have another technological advancement. We have the creation of typewriters. Typewriters actually were initially brought onto the scene in the 1800s and they were predominantly used for expediting, typesetting, for filling out invoices and forms with variable data. But what's really important about this particular typewriter is this is the IBM Selectric. It came out in 1961 and it had a large innovation that really affected typography. And that is that it no longer had letters on individual arms that would clack when you hit the button. So if you've seen a historical typewriter, each letter is on its own arm and it hits the paper as you click the corresponding letter. The Selectric actually had a typewriter ball so there was a ball that could move and hit the paper in the same fashion that those arms did. But the difference was that there were no longer individual metal pieces for all of the different letters and characters. There was actually just one ball. And one of the side effects of this is that IBM actually created balls with different typefaces. So you could actually buy a different font and swap it out in your Selectrics and change to that font. And this is really important, I think, in the study of typography because this is really the first time that the user has the ability to change the typeface. Up until this point, you were stuck with whatever typeface was in the typewriter, whatever typeface the document you received was printed in. This is the first time that the user actually has choice in what typeface they use. Although it was a very limited amount of choices, this is really the beginning of that process. So if you imagine that you have so many typeface choices when you're in Microsoft Word or InDesign or Illustrator, you know, this is really the first time that there's any kind of choice at all. And that was really, I think big for the user to have input or choice in what kind of typeface they were using for their work. Then we have Wim Crowell. He's from the Netherlands and worked at Total Design. He did a lot of groundbreaking and innovative work and was sometimes referenced to as Gridnik. And that was really for his love of grids and his ability to use grids in really creative ways. And this is a piece of typography that he designed in 1967. It's called Neue Alphabet, and it was actually designed to help bridge the gap on the limitations of early photographic lettering. So that's something we'll talk about in a minute, but photographic lettering is the next technical advancement in typography, but in the beginning stages, it struggled to render curved and diagonal shapes. And so Vim really worked to create this typeface that was built out of horizontal and vertical strokes with these 45 degree angles so that it would, be, so that it would really help to create clear typography for photographic lettering. It's also a great example of modular typography. We see that coming back again. The stylistic look to these letters that are really built from the modularity or the structure or system that's behind the way the letters are built. He did this again in 1968 for the Stedelijk Museum. He did a lot of the Stedelijk's work for a long period of time. And this was a typeface he created just for one particular exhibition. So you'll notice right away that the grid is actually visible. So he chose to show the grid. And then on top of it, he shows how the typography perfectly fits on the grid. This is another interesting example of how grids and rationality start to abstract typography and push where things are going. So then we have photographic lettering. So as I mentioned, this is the next advancement. And this really comes with the development of photographic technology. So that starts to finally affect typography because we start to realize that we can do away with the metal we can work with these films or screens that we shoot light through that helps us create letters through a photographic process. 
So they start with glass film, but eventually they move to film that you're seeing here, which is similar to photographic film. It has a black background you're seeing that blocks light, and then the white areas where the letters are allows white through. And then this could be projected, and it could change in size, and other modifications could be made. And during this time, there was one company that was really the predominant leader in this technology, and that was Photo Lettering Inc., P-L-I-N-C. And they had proprietary technology that was really special in that it allowed them to not degrade their masters, but it also allowed for more modifications to be made as the type was being drawn. Because during this era, an art director would call in with a headline of what they would want with the typography. So they would spec the typeface, the relative size, and then the words that they needed set. And then the letterer would actually create the artwork that then would be photographed and included in the magazine or whatever piece that they were working on. And one of the most important people in this is Ed Bengiat. He's an American typographer and he worked for PLINC and produced a lot of their wonderful lettering. He's particularly known for creating lettering systems that had a lot of modifications. This is an example. This is Bengiat New Lock. And what you're seeing here is a photograph out of the photo lettering book. And what's interesting about this is the way these letters are locking together. Now, the way these letters lock together really depends on the word and the context of what it, the letters that are existing there. So this is a great example of those modifications that I'm talking about. An art director would call in with this headline, and then as the letters are being projected, Ed is then able to letter this and make adjustments to create these interlocks where they make sense on the fly and then produce really great typography that has a slightly more custom feel to it. And this was something that was special about PLINC. The photo lettering collection is now all owned by House Industries and they've slowly released it. There's even an app on your phone for it. And this is some of the typefaces that House Industries released in honor of Ed Bengiat. So this is some of his work, but redone by House Industries. And this is Ed Roman, and you can see some of that playful flair that he was so known for. In 1984, the first Macintosh releases, and this really changed graphic design and typography. Because for the first time, we have typefaces on screens, which is a totally different environment than they've ever lived in up until this point. So suddenly there's these low resolution screens where rudimentary typefaces need to exist so they can communicate with their audience. It also for the first time allowed us to create typefaces on the computer and also graphics on the computer, which is really the basis of everything that we do today. And one of the pioneers of this was Susanna Licko. She lives and works in Oakland, California and went to Berkeley. She is a phenomenal typographer and very much known for a lot of her work that she did with Amigre, which is the foundry that she owns with her partner, Rudy Vanderlands. Here's some of her early typefaces. These were created on early computers and they're pixel fonts. That's how we refer to these today. But at the time, these were just fonts that were possible to be created on the computer. Because the screens were at such low resolution, there was these enlarged pixel grids that had to be adhered to. And so Susanna created all these different typefaces that could work on the computer and then be output through printers. And these were then re-released in 2001 as the low res family. And it's really now a homage or a you know, way to create a stylistic element that references those old pixel fonts. But initially these were really created because they were some of the first fonts that were able to be produced at all on these low res computers. She also founded a magazine called Amigre. She did this with Rudy Vanderlinds in 1984. And Amigre magazine was one of the most popular and influential magazines of its time. It really influenced and pushed the deconstruction and postmodern era of design. This is a very typical layout. You can see the expressive typography, the interesting grid structure, the way that the images are scattered across the page. This is very much quintessential Amigre style and really helped fuel the work that, of the 90s. She also did a lot of other very beautiful typefaces. This is Philosophia, which was released in 1996. It's her look at Bodoni. She really wanted to recreate Bodoni, but overcome some of the legibility issues that existed when it works in small sizes. You can also see here at the bottom the wonderful unicase version where she's mixing upper and lower case letter forms, which can be very useful for us in branding and different typesetting scenarios. This is Mrs. Eves, which was released also in 1996. It's her interpretation of Baskerville as a low X height and a wonderful warm quality to it. It's named after Sarah Eves who was Baskerville's housekeeper and then second wife. And she actually took over his business and prolonged his career by keeping his high standards and continuing to re release his work. Then we have Eric Spikerman. He's a German typographer, 
very much known for his work on the computer and his creation of the font font foundry. This was one of the first foundries that helped independent type designers get their typefaces released. Because at this point, most of the juggernauts of the type industry are the linotype and the monotype. So those initially started as machines, but eventually they evolved into being type houses where they would sell the licenses that they had because they owned the rights to so many of these classic incredible fonts. So they would actually sell them in digital formats and then that grew them into these juggernauts of the type industry. So Font Font was one of the first that actually got on the scene and could help allow these independent small foundries to sell their work. Here's some of his typefaces. Meta, Officina Serif, Officina Sans. He's very much known for his work on FF Meta. It came out in 1991 and it has a beautiful, warm, friendly quality. It's also a very narrow sans serif typeface, which gives it an ability to work in small spaces. And it's a very much a humanist blend with a grotesque. And it's also completely made on the computer and has a very warm but digital quality to it. And it's a font that you'll still see used today, although it was very widely used in the 90s and 2000s. This is Scala and Scala Sans from Martin Major. It came out from 1991 to 1993, also through the Font Font Foundry. And it was an example of one of those mega families. During the 80s and 90s, we start to see a lot of corporate rebranding and companies really working on creating a very consistent, unified look and feel. And the typography industry really responds with these large families that have a very consistent voice and style that allow companies to really make one choice that can work in a lot of different environments. And Scala is a great example of that. It had a lot of styles, weights, it had small caps, regular, bold, black, it had condensed versions of it. So it really could work in a lot of different scenarios and was one of the first mega families. Also Thesis and some of the other families that came along in the same way. But their goal here was to make one-stop shopping, a typeface that could really work across an incredibly wide landscape. We also see things like this. This is Barry Deck's Template Gothic that was also released in 1991. It was released by Amigre and it's really based on those plastic stencils that you would use to create letter forms as a kid. But what Barry Dex decided to do here is instead of keeping the perfectness of those letters, he's incorporated the imperfections that often happen when you're using these stencils. So he's purposefully keeping these imperfections to create this narrative quality and it becomes more expressive that way. And this was an extremely popular typeface through the entire 90s. It was often used in a lot of the work of David Carson and other people who embraced postmodern deconstructive design. And it was really about the expressive quality of letters. And we saw a lot of other typefaces like this where it was more about what they felt like and said maybe than how well they were constructed or designed. Even in its digital form, type is still evolving. The font files that contain typefaces have become much more sophisticated allowing for new features, further compatibility, and an increased number of characters allowed. Technology and coding languages like Python have become increasingly more integrated and a part of creating typefaces. So historically, when we had digital type, we had PostScript fonts and TrueType fonts, and not all of the fonts worked on PCs and Macs, and eventually we evolved into OpenType which has allowed for a lot of this functionality to happen and it continues to be improved. And that's really allowed a lot of alternate glyphs to be included and increase the character count. It also has compatibility on both platforms. So we see this first from Eric von Blocklin. He created a typeface actually all the way in 1989 called Beowulf. And it was the first time that code was included in a font file that would manipulate letter forms. And what you're seeing here is that as you type these letters, there's an algorithm that is actually changing where the points of the letter exist. So at the very top, you'll see the lightest weight, although there's no weight shifting here. It just has the least amount of degradation. So if you look on the edges, you'll see the different colors that are showing you the different outlines. So every time you type with this font, it actually randomly changes where the exterior points exist. So if we go down one more, you're seeing the next level of degradation, which makes it more obvious. You can see how different each of these letter forms, that every time you type a letter, it's randomly changing the placement of the exterior points. And that really goes all the way to the bottom weight, which is practically illegible, but it really shows the concept of how coding can be incorporated into font files to really change the way that typefaces work. We saw a lot of problem solving done by Jonathan Hoffler and Tobias Fierre Jones. This doesn't mean it was always involving coding, but they very frequently are using type and pushing the boundaries of type technology to really 
solve complex problems that designers have. They used to run a foundry together called Hoffler and Fier Jones, although they have split and most of it is now run through Hoffler. This is one of their typefaces, Knockout. It was originally designed for Sports Illustrated and it references old American wood type. It has a loose family, but there's a nice relationship between all of the letter forms. It comes in nine widths, which you see at the top, and then six weights, which you see at the bottom. And what's wonderful about this typeface is it creates a lot of flexibility for editorial designers to fit words in different spaces. It's so like this example at the top, where you can see that we're using different styles, so it's more extended and a less extended, but of the same weight, so that these letters actually lock up left to right. So by using that extended weight for is key, it really allows the letters to really lock up into this tight space. The other thing that can be useful with this font is that we have all of the different styles and widths in all of these different weights. So you can actually change the weight of a word within a headline or a piece of text and still allow it to maintain that same width. They also created things like this. This is the Proteus project, which is another one that solves an editorial problem. Each of these four typefaces are a different style, but they all are built on the same metrics which means that you can interchange these words or letters and they will be the same width. You could actually even type a word where certain letters were in each of these four fonts and they would actually still look correct. And this is really useful because potentially if you set a headline in a magazine and you had it fit perfectly and you wanted to change the type style, you could easily change to one of these other styles and it wouldn't affect the width or the placement of the headline. So here's Ziggurat, which is the heavy slab serif from the Proteus project. Here's Gotham, which was released in 2000. It was originally commissioned by GQ magazine and was developed based on inspiration of signage in New York City, particularly the Port Authority bus terminal sign. And it was also very famously used in both of Obama's presidential campaigns. This is Archer. It was originally designed in 2003 for Martha Stewart Living Magazine. So there's an interesting relationship between editorial publications and typefaces. Oftentimes art directors, when they're redesigning a magazine or a newspaper, can't find a typeface that has the voice or the quality that they're looking for. So they'll typically write a brief and hire a type designer to create specific typefaces. And this is a great example of that. You know, this is a really sweet and structured typeface that was really perfect for Martha Stewart Living. They couldn't find something that had this quality. And through the brief, they were able to create something that's really unique. And for Archer, it was initially licensed to Martha Stewart Living and they were able to use it exclusively. But after a period of time, that exclusivity expired and they were able to retool the typeface and release it to the general public. So sometimes these typefaces never expire. There's a permanent license of exclusivity for the user, but oftentimes these typefaces have a window of exclusivity and then the typefaces are eventually released to the general public, which creates this really interesting flow between editorial design and then graphic design. Then we have House Industries, which is in Yorkland, Delaware. It's run by Ken Barber, Rich Rote, and Andy Cruz. And they are the owners of photo lettering. We talked about that earlier, but they also create a plethora of incredible typefaces, many of them very vintage and retro styled, and all of them extremely high quality. They make some of the most high quality display typefaces that you can find. Here's an example of Yorkland Stencil. This is a recent typeface they released. They often also have the most incredible promotional materials and they create a lot of objects oriented around their typefaces. And it's created a lot of notoriety for them because they're able to brand and apply their typefaces in interesting ways that attract their audience. Here's a photo of an exhibition they had at the Henry Ford Museum for Innovation and it was featuring all of their work. You're seeing here some of the work from their Ames typeface. So they created a series of typefaces related to the legacy of the Ames. One of them is based on Ray Ames' handwriting, but the others are based on other artifacts and things that they found. And that's a very typical process for house industries. They don't have families in the typical way that we think of them. Oftentimes the families are thematically related instead of weight. So instead of just having a bold light regular of the same style, there's different actual faces that reference different parts of a potential topic. Here's one of their most famous releases. This is Neutraface, which was designed by Christian Schwartz. It came out in 2002. 
It's based on Richard Neutra's signage that was done for his buildings. He's a modernist architect that worked in California and the Western United States. It's really notable for its lowered crossbar. You can see in the E, the F, the H, the R. It makes it very iconic and easy to identify. It's also extremely ubiquitous. You'll see this typeface everywhere. Extremely popular. Here's some of the process behind it. This is an image of their book. The process is the inspiration. This is a spread about Neutraface. And again, you can see that way that they produce and sell these typefaces. This typeface was actually eventually turned into a slab serif, which you see in the upper right on that pillow. And then the lower is actually a chair that they made, a boomerang chair that they built and sold to promote this typeface. In the bottom, they even partnered with Heath Ceramics and created Neutraface house numbers that you see there in 923. So they're really interesting. They're very much about building products. They do a lot of collaborations with different companies. And the core of it is always typography. This is their Las Vegas Fabulous. This is another great example of them creating a type family based on a theme. There are not different weights of this script. There are just other typefaces that reference other wonderful lettering that we often see in Las Vegas on the strip and in all the various casinos. This is Ed Interlock. This is actually a typeface that's based on the font we saw earlier in the photo lettering section, the New Lock Condensed. So this is a typeface based on N. Benguiat's work. And it's an incredible use of technology in a typeface. There's actually an incredible amount of coding and ligatures that go behind this that allow you to type this typeface out and have it actually create all of these connections. So there's 1100 ligatures and as you type it automatically changes to the correct ones that it needs. You'll notice that it always prefers to go like top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom so that it creates a really natural rhythm to the way that these connections happen. This was coded by Tao Lemming, who's an incredible typographer and someone who is very well versed in the coding and algorithms behind typefaces that really help advance and create this kind of look. Then we have underwear. It was founded by three people who all went to KABK, which is the type media program in Holland. It is one of the top and best design schools for studying type design. Another notable school is in Reading, England, the University of Reading. But both of these schools produce some of the best typographers and have some of the best teaching methods and have really pushed and helped advance the typographic industry. They've also helped advance type education as a lot of their information has disseminated around the world. But this is their typeface, Dolly. It's released in 2001 and is based on Dutch text typography, but it has a really nice calligraphic feel. It's a wonderful typeface because it works well at small sizes and is very readable, but when blown up, it has this warmth and this friendly quality that makes it really special. This is Bello, which was released in 2004. It's a script based on brush lettering. And this is Lisa, which was released in 2009, which is another interesting typeface that uses open type technology to create interesting letters. So there's an incredible amount of alternates inside this typeface that help refrain from more than one letter being repeated. If you look through and find the A's and O's and E's, you'll notice that each of them are slightly different, which helps emulate handwriting. So it's interesting as this technology has evolved, there's a desire to emulate lettering or handwriting rather than it actually looking like a typeface. There's actually a desire to almost hide the quality of it being a typeface by not having all the letter forms be identical. And that's particularly useful in script faces like this. The technology was pushed even further in this one where there's actually an algorithm inside of the code that simulates when the pen will run out of ink. So if you look at the first line, lorem ipsum delor, and you see the R in delor, you'll notice that it doesn't quite connect. And that's referencing the point where you would have had to refill your pen with ink to go ahead and continue to write. So again, there's this desire to kind of go back and make these typefaces even more like handwriting or lettering. As interest in typography grows and access to knowledge, tools, and resources increases, the industry has started to spread further across the globe. This has led to a proliferation of type designers and typefaces, but also led to advancements in non-Latin typography. So as we talked about, there were these two juggernaut schools that still exist and still create some of the best type designers out there. But now there's also other schools that have sprung up and have taught these methods. There's other schools that teach these methods, but for other languages. There's also an ability to create better non-Latin typefaces because the technology allows for more characters and alternates that makes it easier to create complicated scripts that are not using Latin letter forms. The first is Klim, which is owned by Chris Sowersby. This is out of New Zealand. 
And he's someone who has been able to create an incredible amount of high quality typefaces from a country that historically doesn't have a long type history. This is National, which is a grotesque that he released in 2007 to great acclaim. It was used by a handful of publications. It is really built from the inspiration of grotesque typefaces from Europe. This is Pitch, which was a font that was released in 2012. It's based on typewriters. It has a particularly interesting ball terminal feel to it. But due to the internet and the proliferation of this education and technology, Chris is able to have an incredible typographic career when living in an area of the world that maybe historically would not have had a very high profile typographer. We also have Shiva Nala Puluma, who's an Indian typographer who creates Indian typefaces. But he also creates some interesting Latin typefaces that I'm actually going to show. The first is one that is based on Kufic calligraphy, which is the oldest form of Arabic script. And it's very interesting because it's often used in decorative motifs, as you can see here. And what's fascinating is that there's an interesting balance here between black and white. There's a monolinear structure. It's almost maze-like in its appearance. But also these letter forms have to fit into these specific shapes. So not only do they have to fit in these shapes, but they also have to be readable. So it has this incredible ability to morph and fit into these different areas and not only become this beautiful decorative element, but something that's actually readable for the viewer. So he thought, is there a possibility that I could create this using Latin letter forms? And that really led to the creation of Calcula, which is a typeface that he released through Typotech. And you can see here that same idea that beautiful balance of uh, positive and negative space that's being used here, that monolinear negative space that creates that really interesting effect. He also pushed it further by creating shaded and inline versions that create even more interest. But he was able to really solve this by working with Tal Lemming again and using a lot of that technology that we looked at in Ed Interlock. So here there's a series of alternates that are being used and as the letter forms are being typed, it knows what combination of letters need to fit into what way. So you can see here if it's an F, then the E is typed, the E is going to be in this lower location. Or if an L is typed, the E is going to be in this upper larger location. And that really allows it to create that effect and allow it to interlock in that special way each time. And then when I first saw this typeface, I was also shocked and amazed by the patterns that it could create. This was definitely an afterthought, but it's an amazing one. These beautiful positive negative space also allow themselves to be pushed together and blend into these gorgeous patterns. And then even when they're put on paths, they can create these circular, almost mandala-like shapes. So a really interesting other aspect that comes from this typeface. Here's some of Shiva's other Western typefaces. Here's Orwellian, a typeface that he released through Lost Type. It's a reverse stress Italian style slab serif. And then Enemy, which is an interesting, edgy stencil font that was also released through Lost Type. Then we have Christian Sarkis. He is a graduate of the Type Media program at KABK, and he's an expert on Arabic typography. He actually now teaches at KABK in the Type Media program, and he also co-founded Typotech Arabic in 2013, which is really pushing where Arabic typography is going. They're really working to create all of these high quality Arabic typefaces that are based off of the library of Typotech. Because it's really important that we have people who are speaking these languages and know these languages intimately to create them. Because historically these typefaces were created by people who it's not their mother tongue and they maybe do not know the nuances and the details of them. And oftentimes these typefaces aren't always completely accurate. In addition, a lot of these languages have really a dearth of type. There's really a very low number of typefaces that exist, which creates a limited amount of choices. And so it's also interesting for us to look at expanding these areas and looking at the boundaries of how we can create new styles of these different languages. Again, OpenType has allowed this to work too, because the technology exists to really create these complex scripts in digital typefaces, it's allowing us to really push the boundaries and create more and more of it. So this combination of the democratization of the education, the increase in the technology, and the spread of the interest around the globe is really going to increase the amount of high quality typefaces that exist for all of these languages, which is really important, not only for preservation of these languages and to create choices for them, 
but also for the graphic design communities within each of these regions. Because right now they have a very small number of typefaces they can choose from in some places. And by opening that, it'll also increase interest in graphic design and allow for more high quality graphic design and allow for more voices to be heard in these different corners of the globe. So it's not that there isn't advancement happening in Western or Latin typography. There's amazing things happening. But right now, I think the most interesting thing that's happening is this push for more foreign language typefaces and this interest in really preserving language and creating really authentic, high quality fonts that can really work for all of these different languages that exist around the globe.